Um, you know, I, I for Seattle, I know there are some Seattle viewers in the chat, and we will talk to Waz about uh, getting a team back in Seattle. But first, I think it's probably more appropriate uh, to talk about the NBA Players Association, a story that Waz alluded to uh, with uh, DA earlier this week. And Elgin Baylor passed away. Elgin Baylor is a player who is from the generation that my dad always talks about, like that when he was like in his uh, grade school years. He always talked to me about yeah, the, him, Oscar Robertson, and uh, I think Jerry West, I think, are the big three in this story. Was Tell us, I, I have not heard about this, and this is amazing, uh, the story of the 1964 threatened All-Star Game strike. Yeah, so, you know, if, if you do the history, like, they had been trying to get the owners to recognize their union, the, the NBA Players Association, as it's known today, for years and they were getting strong armed right and so what they did and bill russell who obviously is known to be he has a reputation for being a civil rights leader he was at the forefront of all of it mm. at the time right like meeting with malcolm x and martin luther king and muhammad ali etc cetera, etc cetera. um and the nba players decided what they would do at the 1964 all-star game is stage a strike <laughs> and before the game they told the commissioner they said look you got all them people out there that paid their money you got the tv people who have their contracts the sponsors we're not going out there unless you recognize the nba players union mm -hmm. and it worked and they freaking capitulated on site <laughs> said no 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 please just go ahead go ahead have your union and just go to like and and you know and it's a beautiful story one, you know, we I, I brought it up in reference to Elgin Baylor because he was one of the biggest stars in the NBA at the time, right? It's him, Jerry West, uh, you know, Oscar, uh, Bill Russell, as as you mentioned, Jerry Lucas, all of these huge, hugely influential um, guys. They were the stars of the league at the time. And um, for them to use their influence and recognize the only leverage that they had was to threaten the money. You have to threaten the bottom line of these people. They don't just concede power on their own. It always has to be taken out of their grubby ass hands, right? And so <laughs> the NBA players, the stars of that day, they decided like, look, they, they struck at the most opportunistic moment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Where they had these guys by the freaking, <laughs> by the balls. And so- yeah, you know, and, and it worked and it's, you know, and it's one of those things you don't hear about because I don't think it's something that the oligarchs want people to realize the power that you have in a worker strike, right? Like they don't want you to, they don't want us to know that the, the you know, the general citizenry or else that story should be in history books. Like, Absolutely. Not just for yeah. organized labor, but just American sports. Like think about all of the gains that have been made for players. Mm -hmm. um, for the fact of having a players union, right? Like players, it's like, this is a time when certain cats couldn't stay in certain um, hotels on the mm -hmm. road, right? Like right. we're talking about a, a really pivotal time when it comes to civil rights and human rights in, in American history. And so, you know, obviously it, it, it's, it's one of those things that we understand how important it is, but I think the, the power structure does too, or else they would, <laughs> they would be celebrating. There's a reason why they're not celebrating it. Yeah. I just want to quote a little bit from this uh, LA times story here. Just some fascinating um, points. Um, the All-Star game was being televised, as you mentioned, for the first time in 1964, a big deal to the league owners who were pleased to hear about the budding revolt. At times, certain owners would try to get players out of the locker room and browbeat them. Heinshawn said, Red Arbach, the Boston Celtics general manager and coach angrily told Heinshawn that he was the biggest heel in sports. So Arbach was against the union. Interesting, of course. interesting to mm -hmm. know, obviously. I mean, Celtics, yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, Laker owner Bob Short approached the locker room in a fury. He said to an Irish cop that guarded the tell Elgin Baylor if he doesn't get out of there, he's through, Heinshawn said. Baylor's response, sorry, Bob. Uh, Lakers star Jerry West, then 25. This is, this stuff is just amazing to hear. Like he's 20. Imagine Jerry West at 25. Um, then 25 in his fourth season stood his ground with Baylor. I was young and just trying to feel my way along and build a career for myself, West said. A short said to us very threateningly, if you don't play in this game, you're probably never going to play again. Imagine saying that to Jerry West. Jesus Christ. And I said then, uh, I'm never going to play a game. I am pretty defiant. And I mean, yeah, just an amazing wow. story. Like you said, some, there's this history that like 
falls through the cracks because uh, uh, our remem- our memories are controlled by capitalists, basically. Um, yeah, I yeah. mean, they control what stories get told, what stories get marketed, what stories get pushed out. Just think about Martin Luther King as an easy mm-hmm. example. Like, they never associate the word socialism with the great Dr. King. They don't want you knowing about the Poor People's Campaign and the Poor People's March on Washington. They don't want you to understand that Martin Luther King was trying to unite people across gender based on the class question. <laughs> Like, mm. not some kumbaya pie in the sky type of situation. <laughs> yeah. No, literally based on the idea that the commonalities outweighed the little cultural differences that people thought mattered. You know, based on the idea that the bosses were using all of that stuff to sow dissent. And it was nonsense. We needed to get the poor white people on board with the, you know, with the poor blacks and Latinos of the country. But you're not going to hear that. You're just going to hear, you know, more. What's the, the arc of the moral universe? Verse bends yeah. towards he's nuts bends towards justice. Right. I don't fucking know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just you yeah. know, all you ever hear is the is the gushy stuff. You never would hear about the hardcore stuff that he was about. You feel me? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Or and it's like especially with like the NBA union too, right? Um, look at what the NBA is today, and there's no doubt about it. Like we t- we've talked about this before about like, you know, the NBA is really in a lot of ways becoming more and more of a players. Like the players have an incredible amount of power compared to other sure. professional sports. And the union is a huge part of that. 100%. And, yeah. and, and the thing is, they're just now even just tapping into that, right. mm-hmm. that power and that understanding of how important they were. I th- I feel like for a long time, And one of my favorite things about the pandemic is how much it exposed oligarchs for the phonies that they are, right? Um, Just the idea that if somebody's unemployed, if somebody's like loses their job, it was like, well, you should have had three months rent saved up in your bank account. Mm -hmm. The pandemic wasn't out for two weeks before these fools were like, can I, can I have can I have a check, please? <laughs> Treasury Department, Fed, can I have some money, please? No, and nobody browbeat them. Nobody said, yo, you guys are arch capitalists. You guys are supposed to be the best people with money. Where's your rainy day fund? Where's your this? None of it. They didn't hesitate to write a check. They didn't hesitate to guarantee, you know, um, certain financial instruments from the stock market, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody said, wait, where's your three months rent? Yeah. Nobody said that to them. But when normal people fall on hard times, you're an idiot. You're mm-hmm. a dummy. Where's your savings? How come you don't, you, you're not prepared for a rainy day? Oh, you didn't plan ahead. You're worthless, right? <laughs> but, you know, I think with, the, with, this, with, this, with the pandemic and you've seen the ownership class so thirsty mm-hmm. to get the season started back, so thirsty to get mm-hmm. money coming back. Um, it kind of put, you know, it, it laid bare that it's a joke whenever there's collective bargaining sessions happening, when people say, yo, the owners can sit back and just wait for the season and not have it because they're so rich and they're so financially yeah. stable. These black players, they spend so frivolously. They don't. Yeah, right. Tillman Fertitta mm-hmm. took out a loan at 20% interest for $300 million, Jesus. bro. That's how broke this fool is. And he's an owner. So I yeah. love what the pandemic was able to lay bare about the capitalist class, about these lies that get told to us about how they're just so much smarter than us. They're just so much better than us at everything. That's the only reason they're so rich and not that because, you know, everything's been set up for them to succeed. Where do you think we are at for like sort of player labor uh, strength? Because, you know, I it strikes me that a lot of my first glimpses of labor was like the like 99 was it the strike um mm-hmm. and then uh, there's also like, i was a timberwolves fan when there was all this talk about how much kg was be was mm-hmm. making uh, and you know i know you talk about the sort of lebron era of of player power where are we at now and yeah i guess do you see us entering a new era with this COVID stuff you know it's interesting and i think the bubble sort of exposed it to um NBA players are now becoming so rich Mm. that LeBron is not really a worker anymore, right? Like Mm. he's still an employee in the NBA, but he's grown to be so powerful. He's got a lot more in common with, let's face it, with Tillman Fertitta than he does the 15 men on on the Lakers bench. Mm. Um, The guy who's making 2 million a year this year. Like LeBron is so filthy. 
I'm talking about rich, not like corrupt or anything like that. Um, it's it, I'm interested to see what direction these things mm -hmm. go towards because although LeBron is in the context of the NBA, um, obviously an employee and a worker, um, out in the greater society, like when <laughs> when the when the Milwaukee Bucks basically were like, we're not coming out because the cops just killed this dude in Kenosha. Um, and we're not going to play. And they had the players only um, meeting and they were deciding the best course of action to to move forward. LeBron got Barack Obama on the phone. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, like, right. That's a guy that is firmly entrenched within the power structure. If Barry is one phone call away from you and what did Barry tell him to do? Tell him to vote. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Vote. <laughs> that's it. Tell, tell him to just vote. The vote. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. so, you know, and so I'm interested to see how, the direction these things go towards because, again, like the, the TV contracts are at record numbers. And mm. so players are becoming, they're being enriched in ways that we've never seen before. Mm. Right. So I'm, I'm interested to see what direction this goes towards, because I think they are in a position. They have an opportunity um, for Dr. Martin Luther King Day. I said, man, if the players really wanted to honor uh, the legacy of Dr. King, they would um, they would pick up the mantle of the poor people's campaign. They would right. make the plight of working poor people in America that of the NBA players. They'd make themselves the faces of that. And I don't think anybody. There's nobody, nobody on Fox News, nobody on hate radio could um, talk talk slick about fighting for the rights of the working poor. Like, and again, because it's multicultural, multiracial, the amount of working poor in this country, um, I think they would be great to do that. But, you know, LeBron James is, could LeBron James be the face of Bessemer, Alabama? Right. Like when the NBA, I think is in a partnership with amazon.com. You know, like who knows what his what his relationship with Warner Media means, yeah. right? You don't like, have conservatives has... trolling him over that instead of the fucking China all the time, too. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Man, that was. I, I just I just wanted to throw this line because I was I was on the Jackman show yesterday, and, and uh, uh, Ariel, um, who's the host there, wonderful, wonderful, uh, wonderful host, a great show. People should check it out. Um, I was making this really interesting point because we were talking about musicians and, and uh, uh, unions for, for musicians. Because that's a similar kind of problem, right? Where you have superstars, people who are dealing with, you know, issues with streaming services. But obviously, like Taylor Swift is very different from, you know, just someone who plays, you know, clubs that might have a couple, you know, records out on Spotify. Um, but Ariel was making this point that, um, you know, we talk a lot about like the solidarity and like the humanity of unions, and it's very important. But like fundamentally what the potential here is risk sharing, right? And at a certain point, it's also just like self-interest, right? So it's like, even though like LeBron James might, might not like be super personally invested in the, all of these other, you know, folks, the 15th man, whatever, like he does have some interest in risk sharing with other folks, um, you know, what it, what it would mean if you want to take on, you know, the owners or the NBI in general, right? Like that's the real potential there. And I just wanted to throw that that in there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you 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 bring up a, a wonderful point. I just wonder, I wonder how um, top of mind that type of solidarity is. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, of like course. When, when you get to be that rich and that successful, um, and and you are from freaking Akron, Ohio, from mm -hmm. a poor background, right? It's like, man. I've done a lot to get to where I'm at right now, yeah. like a lot. So I wonder if just the 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 notion of a greater good is there, and especially when you get to tell yourself, you know, I'm building schools in my hometown yeah. and I'm lifting mm -hmm. people out of poverty, mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z. I don't know. I, I, it's it's something to definitely think about, and it's something that I'm always going to talk about in my work. But we'll see what direction these guys take yeah. it. Yeah, because I, I think commentary, especially last summer, over certain players and the entertainment function that they serve and being like, do, is this really what I want to be doing? It's like in an era where there's a huge amount of money, it's, it's hard, but yeah. Um, let's move on a little bit. We have a bunch of Seattle followers was, uh, this take, I think might get us in trouble with some of maybe our small market, uh, fans, but, uh, Seattle doesn't have a basketball team. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, it's criminal. It's, yeah. it's, it's absolutely <laughs> criminal. The way David Stern, um, Clay Bennett, and the Starbucks fool, I forget his, what's his name? Howard Schultz, I think. Howard yeah. Schultz, the way Howard they conducted Schultz. that That's entire <laughs> business transaction was 
was freaking shameful. Um, it was horrible. And by the way, and look, OKC has dedicated fans. Like the people in that area love mm. OKC. And it's crazy. I met somebody over the summer who's from Oklahoma. And he actually, you know, he, he gave me a perspective of that team helped the sort of self collective self-esteem of that town in a way that we can't understand. Like mm. ha- getting that team made Oklahoma City people feel like they lived in a real city, yeah. right? Like they were a city worthy of respect and, and glory and attention just by virtue of having that team. And then the team being very successful right out the gate and all of that helps. But like what that team means to those people in that area is very, it's very interesting. And then, you know, something else to think about, not to, because it's a sidetrack, but like, like the idea that these black dudes did that for y'all, yes. <laughs> you know, in that part of the country is, is just a fascinating it's just a fascinating thing to think, especially how Oklahomans self-identify, right? Um, it's it's interesting that Russell Westbrook, a guy from South Central LA, KD, um, James Harden, Sergi Baca from, you know, the Congo, like these are the guys responsible for lifting your collective self-esteem and self-worth as Oklahomans, as Okies, quite frankly. Um, it's just a fascinating sort of dichotomy. But, you know, my man Ethan Strauss talks about it the other day. Like, the NBA has been so kind of stupid and rock-headed about um, market allocation. Like, the idea that you would have a team in Memphis and not one in Seattle just makes absolutely no freaking sense when you talk about the amount of money the amount of um economics involved with a city like seattle is one of our richest cities and just to share market size the amount of people that are there when you compare it to a new orleans a memphis or oklahoma city the nba has been just so inefficient about it but you know they've come out and said a bit, basically they're willing to add two teams to the league I think one of those teams is 100% going to be earmarked for uh, Seattle. We'll see where the next one comes from, whether it be Kansas City, whether it be a St. Louis, whether it be a Las Vegas, which I know the league is scared of having a team there. But um, we'll see what they decide on for the other team. But they've already basically said we're adding two teams. And I would be shocked if one of them was not Seattle. They should stick with the next, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, the Thunder have basically, they've jettisoned all Sonic's history. It's not like yeah. they invite Gary Payton and Sean Kemp mm-hmm. for, <laughs> right. you know, for Sonic's <laughs> night to games, right? Like they've tried to basically forge yeah. their own path um, in that regards. And yeah, the team should be called the Sonics and they should get the records and the, the you know, the the um the history that, that was there. Because like, see, not even just that the team, the, the, the town loved the team, like Seattle and that area has such a rich basketball tradition. Like in the recent years, like when you go from Nate Robinson to Brandon Roy to Jamal mm. Crawford to all of these cats to um Isaiah Thomas and all of these guys that are from that area, like Seattle is a basketball hotbed. Like these people love our game. It's 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 honestly, and this is not even to suck up to the guys who um Seattle people who might be listening to this. It's awful, and they need to get back. Need to get back the NBA in um in Seattle. Awesome. And a one final basketball question: Will I have you? Um, I growing up in the Michael Jordan era, always like the superstar wing that's like my favorite model basketball player so i went easily to kobe my first sort of username online was kobe tracy 07 because i thought oh, yeah. uh <laughs> tracy would join kobe bryant that year and it didn't end up happening <laughs> now fast forward now paul george and Kawhi leonard play on the same team they are who i mean i've been a paul george fan since that pacers uh lebron series mm-hmm. um and Kawhi, you know, you don't need to say anything about his defense and how great he is. And every time they play the Mavs, Luka Doncic, who I think you describe as uh, Gordon Hayward on crack, um, <laughs> uh, absolutely roasts them. What the hell is going on? Because I, I haven't heard anybody comment. I was looking to see if you guys, uh, your podcast commented on uh, Paul George guard Luke at the end of that game. And I don't know what happens. He just goes to the floor on a behind the back dribble. Like, I don't know what's happening that Luca just toasts those guys so much. 
Well, I mean, it just goes to, sh- I don't think that's a uh, an indictment of Paul George or Kawhi Leonard. I think it's just Luka Doncic is that special of a player. Right. Um, his understanding of angles, his understanding of change of pace, change of speed. He's just, he's savant like with that stuff, that part of the game. It's not, because it, people think like, if you can't, don't have the raw speed to run in a straight line that you can't get by anybody. No, it's mm. like, he knows where he's going in the defender doesn't right and so he understands what his advantage is and he understands angles he understands once he gets his shoulder past somebody he's big enough to absorb any kind of contact so that guys can't bother his shot he's developed a mean killer step back so people respect the drive Mm -hmm. so they have to give him a little bit of space so when he does Mm -hmm. go to the step back there's plenty of room and airspace to get his shot off i just think he is um a one of a kind once in a generational talent that's 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 what's happening there. Mm. Um, Kawhi Leonard is certainly not, he's not the defensive level, defensive player of the year level guy that he once was. Mm. Um, None of us are, right, anymore. (laughs) Who do you you watch on the defensive side of the ball now? Is it it Ben Simmons or who are you watching? Um, I think perimeter wise, you would have to say Ben Simmons is one of the ones. Um, Joel Embiid also incredible defender. I love Mikael Bridges from the Phoenix oh, Suns. Yeah. Like this guy is long. He's quick footed. He has the instincts. He can guard wings. He plays the passing lanes. Like he's a really fun guy oh. to watch um, play defense. But yeah, I think Ben and, and you know what I like about Ben Simmons? And I said this recently on the show. I think there's something to the idea that he's gone out of his way to let people know that he takes pride in his defense. Yeah. That no, I'm not going to drop 30 a game, but I get busy on the defensive end of the floor. I bust my ass and I know that that's what helps my team win at the end of the day. Right? right? So I think just mentality wise, that's something if you're a Sixers fan, you should be very happy about because let's face it, everybody wants to be the guy that dropped 30. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants because that's the guy who gets the commercials and goes yeah. to the all star games, et cetera, et cetera, and gets the girl. But you know, defense is it's it's not uh, people always say it's just as important as offense. It's not, it's that this studies that and, and, and <laughs> metrics to prove that like it's a lot easier to get a guy who's a bad defender to be competent at defense than it is to get a bad offensive guy to be competent at offense. So, offense is just, just they're more it's just more premium of skill, but. Defense is important. And a lot of teams, the, the Lakers of last year being a prime example, they won that championship on the back of their elite defense. Right. If you watch mm-hmm. game six of the NBA finals, um, Anthony Davis is somebody, when he's to start the year, trust me, if you've been watching that all in the NBA, Anthony Davis has not tried. But if you go back and watch game six of the NBA finals, he was insane. He was, he was everywhere. He was destroying people. And so that's what propelled them to the championship. So, you know, those type of cats are cats that I love watching. People that take their defensive assignment, take pride in the defense that they play. It's funny just to go back to the Clippers. I remember the, all those years with uh, Chris Paul and DeAndre and Blake, they needed a three and D wing. And they just could never get that guy. And now they have like two of the best in the league. <laughs> I know. And they went through so many, like, you know, it was like a Matt Barnes. And then it was the Raw dude. And it was all of these, these Bobby Simmons or what's, yeah, Bobby Simmons and all these other wings. They could never get it right. And yeah, now they have two, you know, Tyrannosaurus um, Rex type of cats who will just destroy people. Um, And yeah, and I think in the playoffs, wing Having elite wing play has proven to be what gets you to the championship, mm-hmm. right? Like it's having the LeBrons, having the KDs, having the Kawhis, having these six foot eight guys who can dribble, pass, and shoot has proven to be um, the best way to achieve playoff success. So I think the Clippers are well positioned to do their thing in the playoffs. And in the last two years, they've been the team that's given the Lakers the biggest matchup problem of anybody in the league. Obviously, we see what's going on in Brooklyn, where KD's not even back yet, and they're just drubbing fools and, you know, s- setting scoring records, excuse me, all-time scoring records. So I, I think the-, the teams with the wing depth are generally the teams that you got to pay attention to. Right. Well, Wazi Lambre, thank you so much for joining us, man. Anytime. Um, Thanks for having me, man. Salute to you, brothers. I'm very proud of you. 
Um, I love what you guys are doing. You guys are fucking carrying the torch and doing it so well with the integrity and just, you know, just dominating, man. You guys are dominating the left media space, man. <laughs> Thanks so much, man. We're going to get together soon. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. Love you guys, man. Be good. See you,